I appreciate you joining us this morning. Uh, my name is David Johnson. I serve as the uh, Chief Assessment Officer at the Federation. And my colleague is Dr. Uh, Michael Jodwin, who is the Senior Vice President at NBME. We wanted to provide an update this morning uh, specific to the USMLE program. And it's been a couple of years in which we've had some pretty significant changes. And Mike's going to talk about those in particular. I was going to, however, make sure that we answered almost some foundational questions up front. And so for some of those toward the back, I might read a couple of these just so I make sure you can hear this or see this. Um, we want to make sure we start with just answering some basics today, which is who and what the USMLE is, because I was trying to keep in mind the fact that uh, we have, I think, about 200 of the 450 attendees who are brand new to the FSMB annual meeting. We don't want to assume too much necessarily. So we're going to explain you know, who and what USMLE is. We want to, going to talk about the uh, role and importance of assessment for licensure, because I want to put that in a little bit of context, because I know that for many of you today, the, the licensing or the assessment piece of licensure is something that is really pretty staff oriented. And in some ways, you're checking boxes just to make sure somebody ticks off all those boxes and then it just sort of moves through. We also want to talk about how do you participate in USMLE because it is critically important that we continue to have individuals with the experience on state medical boards, both members and staff, who can participate meaningfully with the program and we'll walk you through some of the options that are available. We'll also discuss, you know, how can you stay up on the developments in USMLE. I mentioned that we've had, obviously, a number of changes over the past couple of years. Well, there are some ways to stay attuned to that that don't necessarily always require you to uh, go to the USMLE website, while well, that's important, but some other tools we have handy for you. And of course, what has changed with USMLE? And Mike's going to kind of walk us through some of those big changes. Let me just start, though, with a, a reminder of some basics about the program itself. The USMLE is now roughly 30 years old. It was established in 1991 as a joint program of the Federation and the NBME. And we have a, a very key collaborative partner in the ECFMG as well. These three organizations, though, have a, a long track record of working together. Uh, you may not realize this, but prior to the USMLE, there was an examination called the Federation Licensing Exam. Well, that was actually, and dating back to the 1960s, the first collaborative effort between the Federation and NBME in the assessment field itself. And our colleagues at NBME have been critical in supporting our colleagues at the ECFMG when prior to USMLE, they had their own examination assessing medical science knowledge for their ECFMG certificate. So the relationship simply grew even stronger under the USMLE program. The USMLE is a pretty high volume uh, assessment program. We've had over 3 million test administrations since the first USMLE step was administered back in 1992. I think we're at around 3.4 million test administrations today. And in fact, if you would take a look at the, uh, some of the information specific to the over 1 million physicians who have an active medical license in the United States today, you would find that approximately 58% have taken all or part of the USMLE sequence. So as this 30 years has passed, over uh, the majority of physicians in this country, one of the common experiences they've had is taking a USMLE step. One other basic I thought I would mention is the fact that when we think of uh, physician licensure in the United States and we think of medical education, it's easy to start with sort of the, the very obvious US lens. but we have a large number of international medical students and graduates who take a part of the USMLE sequence every year. And in any given year, it could be anywhere from 35 to 38 percent of all the test administrations involve international medical students or graduates. Now, I mentioned that I did think it was important maybe to set a little bit of a context of, you know, even how we got to USMLE and, and why the state medical board involvement uh, is so critical here. I think one of the things I would point you to is that small photo in the left of the North Carolina Medical Board. 
They were the first state medical board established in what we might call the modern era back in 1859. Our colleagues in North Carolina led the way. Well, in those days, uh, the most common name that was applied to those boards was usually something like the Kentucky Board of Medical Examiners or the Massachusetts Board of Medical Examiners. It wasn't accidental that that phrase medical examiner was in the title of virtually every one of those state boards in those days. And that was for the simple reason that the fundamental or primary reason that those boards were brought into existence was there was such a wide disparity in the quality of medical education that it was deemed critical that somebody do some sort of assessment, whether it was a written exam or an oral exam, of these individual physicians before you actually issue a license itself. And so consequently, from about 1859, starting with North Carolina, through well into the 1970s, we're talking about an era of state-based examinations for medical licensure. We're talking about a time period when each and every state actually was writing and administering its own exam. Um, so this was such a key function of the state medical boards, and they were so integrally involved, for instance, that uh, you had a lot of data being published on an annual basis, for instance, in, the, uh, in JAMA. They had an uh, annual issue that always broke down the statistics around the performance on the licensing exams in every state. They did that well into the 1960s, and it only began to change when in the 1960s there was uh, some concern about is that model of having the states develop their own exam really sustainable? And there were two very critical articles that ran in the Federation's bulletin in those days. One involved a, a very important uh, measurement scientist and educator named George Miller, who looked at roughly 20 state medical board licensing exams. And I'll cut to the chase. He said, you know, I have some serious concerns about the validity of the decisions to issue a license that are being made based upon what I'm seeing in these exams, the nature of the questions, the quality of the content. The other piece that really got the State Medical Board's attention, I believe, was in 1965, uh, Robert Derbyshire, who was a former chair of the Federation, published an article in the Federation's Bulletin that looked at some of that performance data around state exams. And what he pointed out was that there was a number of states in which not only in a given year, but in a multi-year sequence, nobody failed that state's exam. And Derbyshire's point was pretty, pretty clear. He, didn't, he was not convinced everybody that was passing those examinations probably had the minimums, minimal requisite knowledge for a medical license in that state. So he, in pointing that out, really led to the initiative that created the Federation Licensing Exam, which is one of the predecessors of USMLE. So why do I share that much history when we're really talking about something today, USMLE? Because I think there's one, uh, there's two principles actually that I believe are still critically relevant and important to you as medical regulators. And that is assessment is still important today because it is really providing assurance along two principles. One is that there is still tremendous value in an independent audit of the education and training, and in this case, specifically the knowledge of a prospective candidate for licensure. Now keep in mind, it was easy to defend that position and articulate it in a day when, in the late 19th and through the early part of the 20th century, there were no accrediting bodies for medical education in this country. And we knew the wide quality or disparities in quality in, in medical education. And yet at the same time, it's probably not correct to assume that just because we have accreditation, you can assume that essentially, well, everyone's going to do just fine without any kind of check of assessment. I, I'm thinking of an article that appeared in the New England Journal probably within the last 18 months, maybe it's been two years, but by a couple of medical educators, and its title was very telling. It was titled as a commentary piece, Kicking the Can Down the Road. It was from a medical educator's perspective explaining, we recognize as educators, there are individual students who probably are moving through the pipeline, moving through the system, who for many reasons are not being 
given an off-ramp into something that's probably more appropriate when it's clear that perhaps medicine and patient care is not what they should be doing. So that's one of the key principles right there. Somebody has to perform that independent audit, and it's critical that state medical boards hold on to that role. The other key piece of assessment in licensure that I think is very relevant today is the value of a common national standard. And again, that's part of the reason I shared that uh, a little bit about the origin of the flex exam and the demise of state exams. Because the reality is that if you had in those days with flex and the NBME parts, it was very common for us to hear criticisms that, well, wait a minute, how, how do I as an examinee know that the exam I'm taking, maybe it was the flex, how do I know that isn't harder in terms of the standard you're asking me to clear compared to the NBME parts exam, or vice versa. By its very nature, when you have more than one assessment tool or lacking essentially a common standard, it raises questions about equity, fairness, and in this instance, uh, the standard you're asking someone to meet. There's no questions when everybody's meeting the same common national standard. So I share that because I think it's still important that medical regulators, even though I recognize that for licensing and the USMLEs fitting into that piece is what uh, largely administrative in some ways, and it's something your staff handles when everything's kind of a clean record coming through, it's still important that as regulators you recognize there's a reason that that's baked into your statute. It's an important function. I was going to share just a little bit about the USMLE program structure in case you're not as familiar with it. The USMLE STEP exam is actually a series of examinations, three different examinations that medical students and graduates take at various points in their progression through the educational continuum. Uh, in general, the medical students in this country are going to take steps one and two before they graduate. They generally will take step three, oftentimes toward the end of the first year of residency training, maybe the second year. Uh, in many states, there's actually some requirements that actually dictate the timing when they have to have that step three taken so they can get their full and unrestricted license. And you can see it's about a four-day examination sequence in total, predominantly comprised of multiple choice questions, uh, though we do have an interesting uh, format called the clinic, uh, comp excuse me, our clinical case scenarios, or CCS in step three, which really asks someone, as opposed to a multiple choice item, where you need to recognize what the best answer is that's listed in front of you. In that CCS scenario, you're really actively managing a case. It's a high volume uh, that we do. There's about 113,000 test administrations that we do annually. Um, and I've also noted that it is offered year round. I've, I've been around the FSMB now for about 25 years. Uh, when I started, we were administering this exam on paper and pencil. Those are very different days. It seems light years away now to think back to that kind of test administration. We've been doing this through computer-based test administration since 1999-2000. I, I, this may be maybe the most important slide I'm going to show you today, and that is volunteering, or at least considering volunteering with the USMLE program. We have been very fortunate as a program to have such solid participation from members of the state medical board community over the years. Uh, since the program's origin, over 300 people have participated in some capacity, whether that's writing items, of one of the committees that writes items serving there, whether it's acting or serving on a standard setting panel, uh, whether it's on a governance level committee. It's been critical that we have that kind of input. And in fact, last year we had 25 individuals from 18 different medical boards who have participated with the program and offered very significant contributions because it's, in, it's very important that we have that nice mix on the uh, committees that we use through the USMLA, a mix of folks that have that licensing perspective or experience, individuals maybe coming from academic medicine, individuals in private practice from all parts of the country and various specialties uh, re represented as appropriate. If you have an interest in this area, my direct ask is, and I'm going to ask Francis, will you kind of stand up and actually identify yourself to the audience? That's Francis Kane. If you think you have an interest, I mean, at the very least, you know, email Francis. She can have a conversation with you about the opportunities that are available. If you feel like, you know, I really want to get involved, 
we are going to ask you to probably ultimately send a CV or a bio and some sort of statement of interest because our colleagues at NBME keep a nominee database. And I can't guarantee that, you know, we can get you on something right now uh, for the simple reason that there's only a limited number of slots that open up on committees and work groups each year. But if you'd like to talk to us about this, just let us know. Uh, drop off a business card or email Francis. I mentioned there's ways to stay up to date with USMLE, and I would really encourage you to be looking for some of these. What you see on the right is something that Francis actually developed for us about a year and a half ago, which is a regular quarterly FSMB update to the State Medical Board's community, specific to the USMLE program with news of, of note, uh, of developments that are happening in the program itself, and oftentimes spotlighting some of our committee members who do have that perspective and experience on state medical boards. Um, I would encourage if there's any executive directors in the room, uh, perhaps this is a nice item you could sl slip into your executive director's sort of slot on the agenda for your board meetings. Uh, we think it's, it's a nice, easy way to uh, stay up on some of the most recent developments with the program. And I would also encourage you to consider following us on Twitter, which I know, uh, and I'll be honest, I'm of a demographic that's probably not one that does Twitter as much. But um, I recognized a few years ago that that's probably a miss in not being out there professionally because it's a good way to stay abreast of a lot of developments and happenings in areas that I have an interest in, specific to assessment, medical education, and frankly, more broadly, medical regulation as a whole. So I would encourage you to think about that because I think it is, a, at this day and age, an appropriate supplement to your, your work activities. And of course, the go-to is our USMLE website. Uh, we don't want to rely solely upon that, but that is the best definitive source for information that's always going to be updated and available. So I would make sure that, you know, you might want to check that on a periodic basis because we do have things that change in the program periodically. And the last thing I was going to share before turning over Mike is that if you have some questions, I wanted to identify a couple of people in the audience. I know Alex Machaber, our vice president uh, for USMLE at the NBAB, is not in attendance today. Alex has got a, a daughter graduating from the University of Michigan, but he is sort of my, my counterpart over at NBME and leading the USMLE efforts. Uh, at the office of the USMLE Secretariat, I'm Amy Bono, I'm gonna ask you to stand up and wave. I see you back there. Amy is who you would want to be contacting, she or one of her staff in that office, because you may have questions that deal with things like, oh, somebody's reached out to my board and they're asking to uh, have an additional attempt at a USMLE step, even though they're over the attempt limit. Her staff can help you navigate that. Or, hey, I've gotten a transcript that this person had irregular behavior and I'm not sure what I want to do with this. Her staff can help you with that. And Francis Kane, I've mentioned as well, Francis is on the Federation side that's going to be able to help you answer questions and direct you as needed. So Mike, I'm going to turn it to you to talk about some of the changes that have been happening. Good morning. Good morning. Let's see if we can get that at the right height. Dave is a little taller than me, I think. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk about uh, these five topics here. Uh, covering a little bit of uh, the kinds of changes and the kinds of, um, both for the USMLE program and, the, and in the context around the USMLE program that have occurred over the last couple of years. Let's see if this wants to go. So a little bit about the, the pandemic and the, the, pa the disruption that the USMLE program faced. Um, certainly in the first few months of the, uh, of the shutdown, uh, where we had lockdowns and uh, those uh, uh, really difficulty uh, delivering USMLE steps. Um, we were looking for other alternatives to, to do that. And one of the things the USMLE program uh, created was something we called event testing, which instead of uh, testing within Prometric centers across the US and internationally, we uh, used some alternative software and delivered USMLE exams in medical schools uh, within the United States itself. So that created uh, some real opportunities for us to explore some other avenues um, to uh, deliver the USMLA and really meet the needs of US um, uh, medical students and the, and the system as well. Um, I think the other thing that we've really worked very diligently at during this time 
is outreach and collaboration with medical faculty, medical schools, and students themselves. So certainly as we've, uh, as we've gone through this process, you can imagine the, the issues and challenges with uh, staff members getting sick, uh, centers and sites needing to close as a result of um, uh, as much as anything else, staff members uh, 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 having COVID. And so trying to make sure that we uh, facilitate that process for students to get them into the test centers, be able to get through the USMLE sequence, um, and to, to provide them the services that they really need to move uh, forward, and in many cases to get into um, and deliver patient care as quickly as possible. Um, Throughout this process, one of the things we really wanted to emphasize was the, the appreciation we have for state medical boards and their flexibility. Um, certainly as we think about step three, uh, and in those states where there uh, are temporary licenses, um, the, the, the ability for state medical boards to offer temporary licenses to create some flexibility for those um, uh, examinees to get in into practice to begin providing care uh, while the system um, uh, accommodated and, and allowed for that to, uh, for students to get back in was really appreciated. There we go. So I think the most recent and probably the most uh, high profile change that you'll, you'll hear me talk about is the, the very recent change to uh, step one becoming uh, only pass fail. So all examinees who began their, their testing of step one on or after January 26th are only going to receive a pass-fail outcome for step one. They won't re receive a numeric score. And as you, as you might imagine, that uh, affects the licensing community uh, 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 only marginally, right? Uh, the licensing community tends to look at whether a student has passed or failed, but within the residency selection space, that's a, uh, a bigger transition. So uh, the thing I wanted to emphasize here within the transcript is that the, in, large, in large part the transcript won't change. The space where the step one score used to appear uh, will now just be blank. Um, you'll still see a, just an indication of pass or fail as, uh, as was the case before. I think that the two things we wanted to note for, the, for this audience was uh, at the bottom of the transcript, these notes, right? So as you go through, like uh, the vast majority of the transcripts you'll see are going to uh, indicate students with who've attempted each step one time and passed the exam, but clearly, as you uh, go through the number, the different kinds of, uh, the number of candidates who are applying for licensure, some of them will have failing attempts. Some of them will have notes at the bottom here that uh, reflect things like irregular behavior or other elements. And as Dave noted, the US Secretary's Secretariat's office can help you interpret those if the language is not uh, clear already. The other thing we wanted to emphasize was that uh, we provide these transcripts to you directly, and we want to uh, caution uh, you about accepting uh, copies of transcripts from students. Um, that the, those issues around um, whether they are authentic, whether the information on them are authentic, are, uh, are, uh, could and, and may be a, a place of concern. So we really want to emphasize the receipt of these uh, directly from the USMLE program. A little bit about attempt limit modification. Uh, so in 2021, we uh, transitioned our policy from a six attempt limit for each step to four. Um, there is a recent uh, article in the, journal, in the Journal of Medical Regulation that uh, talks about the data that supported this decision. Um, I think from a licensure perspective, this should have relatively little impact on most state medical boards. It uh, really aligns our policy with where most states had moved to. The vast majority of states have attempt limits that are four or less. Um, it varies a, a little bit from state to state. Um, and one of the reasons it's unlikely to have a, a profound impact is um, most students who, who have uh, four or more attempts are not making it through the entire licensure process and getting to licensure. Either they uh, fall out through uh, uh, medical school requirements uh, or are unable to attend or obtain a residency. And so usually they'll fall out of the, the, the pipeline prior to that, that place. 
Uh, as Dave noted, there is a, an opportunity for state boards who want to uh, uh, seek an additional attempt for a candidate to do so, assuming it's within the state regulations. Uh, the other substantial change that's uh, happened in the last couple of years is the, the ending of the Step 2 Clinical Skills Examination Program. Uh, uh, clearly, this was a difficult decision for the USMLA program. Um, uh, and I would say that our, our focus and our direction continues to be on uh, looking at the well, a well-rounded set of competencies required for safe medical practice. So in that context, uh, the, the kinds of competencies embedded within the Clinical Skills Exam, communication skills, clinical reasoning to name two, um, continue to be an area of focus uh, within the other parts of the exam, and an area where we are really focusing on additional research and development activities to uh, really enhance this part of our assessment. Um, the U.S. Army program uh, does see itself having a role here, but we do not believe it's going to be within the OSCE-like format that has been fairly ubiquitous for, at this point, 20 or 30 years, certainly within medical schools. Um, uh, and just to, to, be no, uh, to be clear, we don't plan to uh, relaunch a standalone full day exam in this format at all. Um, a couple other notes about clinical skills. Uh, we are not uh, planning on a, t on a testation model. Uh, we don't see that adding a significant value. Uh, essentially what we would uh, assume is that medical schools that are uh, willing to grant a degree are very unlikely not to attest that their students have these skills. And so we view that that as, as more of an administrative burden than something that adds significant and meaningful value. Uh, the ECFMG, however, as part of the, the certification process, uh, and you saw a little bit of this yesterday uh, in, I believe, Hank's talk, um, have created a series of pathways for international medical graduates to begin to demonstrate some of those skills, including spoken English. Um, our focus really is on accelerating research and development to enhance uh, some of the critical competencies underneath uh, this. And I thought I would give you uh, just a, a little bit of a teaser about the kinds of things that we're working on. So uh, many of you will, will probably think of MCQ questions and as you know, dry text descriptions. Um, that's really hasn't been the case in the, in the USMLE program for a long time. You'll see video, you'll see a lot of uh, high resolution images. Uh, right, MRIs, uh, 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 heart, heart sounds, lung sounds that students need to listen to and interpret. Um, and so these kinds of capabilities really allow us to do uh, some, some much more sophisticated things. So one of the, the formats we're working on right now is really recording either what is likely to look like a spoken or a video response. Uh, and, and here's an example of the kind of scenario that would come in. You'd watch a short video, um, in this case of Mabel, with a little bit of a vignette describing a, a clinical situation. In this case, uh, Mabel has received a, a recent uh, mammogram with a suspicious spot that uh, mm -hmm. revealed an invasive breast cancer. And the candidate uh, is asked, uh, uh, sees a video and says, uh, she's here today to learn the test results. You enter the room, you greet her, and ask her how she's doing, and she replies, I haven't slept well since the biopsy. And the student is asked to respond uh, in, a, in a relatively uh, short clip, you know, maybe a couple minute response, that which we would uh, then evaluate and respond. And you might imagine that this kind of uh, range of scenarios that could really tap into some of the, the critical communication skills that would be required. Last and, and certainly not least is uh, the work the program has been doing and continues to do related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, in the last year, we've continued to make some enhancements to the process related to uh, the ADA, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, to make sure the exam is accessible to students with any uh, number or range of, of uh, accommodations that might be required, whether that is, uh, you know, uh, a visual or an audio impairment, uh, uh, et cetera. So we're really working on that process, um, trying to make it uh, uh, more rapid. Um, but continue to make sure it's fair to, to provide accommodations to students who need them to access the exam, but also not to provide accommodations uh, to students who don't need them. Uh, there is a, uh, has been a, a standing patient characteristics task force reviewing all of the USMLA content to make sure it 
it represents um, kind of the modern and uh, appropriate views of, of content um, and demographics within the program. The USMLE program has been working on research and publications related to uh, group differences. So uh, there is a, even preceding the pandemic, there was a, a fairly lengthy article looking at uh, gender and race uh, performance differences on the exam. Uh, I think that came out in 2019. Uh, and there's been some follow-up work that's coming out now related to how does that look uh, kind of at the, item, at the item level rather than at the score level as well. Um, so th that has been an area where we've been uh, pretty diligent about trying to uh, get some national data out there uh, to reflect what the exam is doing and to inform the, the various stakeholders who are using the exam well. Um, uh, there are a series of other activities in this area going, uh, going forward that I would expect will be published in the next year or two. Things like if we change the race or gender of a patient, how does it affect the way students answer a question or not? And, uh, you know, the, the short teaser answer I'll give to you is um, very little. Um, that, uh, you know, uh, we're just, just completing a study where we've done that uh, across uh, 50 items and the, the way in which students selected the various alternatives really didn't change. Um, and the last but uh, not least thing I'll mention here is really the, the U.S. Army program is beginning to, to take a stronger voice uh, and, and advocacy around the, the holistic review and appropriate use of U.S. Army scores, particularly in that UME to GME transition. Um, I think for, for several years, we, we um, didn't step into that, that that's not a, a process or an area we control, but we did recognize that um, uh, through the in Invitational Conference on U.S. Assembly Scoring, that that was a place where um, our concerns uh, had become heightened, and it really led to that, that step one pass-fail decision. But we're going to continue to advocate for, for a, a smoother and, and more effective transition uh, between UME and GME and a, a, a more appropriately weighted use of the U.S. Assembly scores within that process. So I think we're close to, uh, close to the end of our prepared remarks, but happy to take yeah. questions. Yeah. Great. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for a nice presentation. I'm uh, Naveed Razak from St. Louis. Um, question I had, and you probably have answered part of it, is the pass-fail. You know there is a large pool of international medical graduates, every year they are trying to get into the residency program. One of the criteria was to see what the scores they were. So if they were in the 190s versus someone who's scoring 260, so you could really tell um, for the residency program directors to, they would screen probably if someone wrote 120, not even interview them. So we, uh, that criteria has been taken away so how do you really respond to that? Sure. You want to start it for me too? Go ahead. Okay. Well, a couple of thoughts. Uh, first is that we recognize we're, at, first of all, in a bit of a transition, obviously. This next match cycle that's going to be taking place is going to be the first that really sees a, a blending of individuals that are presenting a USMLE step one that has a pass-fail as well as those who have a numeric score. What we have been encouraging, this was Mike's point about holistic review, is we've been speaking with counterparts elsewhere in the House of Medicine, specifically colleagues at the AAMC, for example, to really encourage that we think carefully about how the systems that are in place at this time, specific to ARIS in particular, are set in such a way that we are not going to be disadvantaging people simply by virtue of the fact they might have a pass-fail when you have a mixed population. That's not necessarily a process we can control, but we have already made our position clear in terms of we don't think any filtering that's going to simply automatically move people to the side is fair or appropriate on multiple levels. I think the other reality we recognize as an interim basis is that it's quite possible until we have a better overall holistic review system, if you will, we suspect that there will be those programs that feel that they have to really winnow down some of the field may begin to look more closely at a step two CK score and may use that. I think that's just acknowledging a reality that will happen with some programs in particular. Yes, sir. Oh, go ahead, Mike. So I think the one thing I would add is for a long time, the, the, score, the score interpretation materials that the USMLE program has provided 
have emphasized that over-interpreting small differences in USMLE scores yes. is not appropriate. That uh, rank ordering these folks from 300 down and kind of drawing a magic line and assuming score differences that are relatively modest reflect some meaningful difference in performance and using that as a basis for selection doesn't reflect a holistic review that is an appropriate or data-based uh, interpretation of the US MLE scores. And so that's the other, the other component in, in that process that I think yep. we really want to emphasize that uh, folks who are assuming a, a couple point difference in the US MLA, um, somehow prepare someone better for one residency than another candidate without looking at all the other ways in which they are uh, a good fit is something we want to de-emphasize and, and frankly within the step one uh, pass-fail decision uh, eliminate the, the capability of folks to, to make, um, uh, to over-interpret the data in ways that uh, are not appropriate. Why don't we go to the, to the back, that person was next, then we'll come to the front mic. Let's Heidi Koenig Heidi. from Kentucky. I just want to raise a concern about um, Step 2 CS. Many individuals take this exam and pass. A few take this exam and fail. The folks who failed 18 months ago do not have four opportunities to remediate. And I would plead that we need to drop those scores to either give them an opportunity to clear their record. I mean, state medical boards, residencies, future employers are all gonna see this as a huge scar. And everybody that went before them had four opportunities to remediate and you know, some of those fails were bad judgment, got stuck in the airport till three in the morning, took the exam at seven. And some of them were true fails. But the true fails will be identified by other means. And I have, I'm sorry, I'm hogging the microphone, but I have one comment on the holistic review um, we're very concerned. Anesthesiology, 240 or less, you know, I, I get so furious with the program directors, the hardworking, middle of the class medical student that came to us and did a rotation with us is the best candidate. And I encourage strongly away rotations to do a four week assessment since we're doing all our interviews virtually. So I just throw that out okay. there. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, to your first point or your first comment about uh, the CS and the, the fact that that, uh, that exam history remains on the USMLE transcript, that was a very specific conversation of the USMLE composite committee that includes individuals from the state medical board community that serve on that policy setting body. There was extensive conversation about that, and it was not an easy decision. But what, at the end of the day, was the point that carried uh, the weight of that discussion was that ultimately USMLE needs to be transparent as a, an examination or assessment tool for the licensing community. It needs to be transparent in what we know about individuals. And so just as, if, for instance, we knew there was some allegation or some findings of irregular behavior with the exam, that has to be noted on the transcript so the board is aware of it. We felt like it would not be appropriate to essentially withhold that information, though knowing uh, that there were individuals that, you're right, Heidi, did not have the opportunity to remediate and retest. We knew that was one of the downsides, but it was ultimately felt to be more important that we have to make sure that state medical boards know what we know in our assessment capacity about that specific candidate. And so that was ultimately the point that the uh, individuals on the composite committee who were from the state medical board community f felt pretty strongly about in, in pressing for that policy. Good morning. David Diamond, Florida Board of Medicine. Uh, quick question. With respect to the notes, did you make a comment that it would include things such as a person not passing the exam on prior occasions? Was that correct? Well, the transcript actually lists all test administrations, so that would be evident on each transcript. So getting back to the gentleman's question earlier, 
I fully understand the concern about not over relying on a numerical score on dictating a person's future in medicine. Having said that, speaking to his point, I also believe that this, that this numerical data can give tremendous information and help people that otherwise would be disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a person's coming from a lesser renowned medical school, perhaps has a background that somehow is uh, less illustrious. Scoring very well on an exam like this is something that can lift that patient up and give more opportunity. So I was actually quite disappointed to see the change, and I'm a believer in having more and more information, not just numerically, but on, but on individual reviews of, of, of different committees and, and individuals to help make the best individual assessment of a, of, of a candidate. Thanks. Uh, I, I think what I would say is that part of what really, we acknowledge, first of all, what the scenario you're describing, I should say. We recognize there were some individuals or candidates from institutions that perhaps did not have the prestige, perhaps outside of the United States, that did see value clearly in a numeric score. And that, so that was a difficult part of that conversation. But Mike raised a valuable point, which was it, was it felt almost inappropriate for USMLA as a program to turn a blind eye to a continued secondary use that had this granular look that Mike was describing, knowing that Mike, I'm not the measurement scientist, but the greatest accuracy on our scoring scale is not on that top end. It's around the cut score, is it not? It is. And so it, it felt like in some ways if we did not make a change, we were simply con continuing to contribute to a secondary use that we felt was very problematic at this point, had become very problematic. Um, not sure who's next. <laughs> The one at the back, probably. Thank you very much. I'm Divine, Registrar of the Medical and Dental Council of Ghana. And just excuse my ignorance, but I was asking in respect of regulators like us who train from different countries, just what should we focus on in terms of assisting our medical graduates so that I know I have a huge number of graduates who come into your country to take your examinations and to practice. Focusing on the clinical skills assessment and also the changes at ECFMG, what should we keep in mind so that we can advise and assist our medical schools so that our graduates are not disadvantaged when they are coming in here? to take your assessments. You want to start out? Sure. So the, the USMLE program is really designed to assess the range of competencies. There are a number of competency models that um, look very uh, similar uh, across many countries, right? The, the AC, ACGME has them, uh, the British Council has them, uh, Canada has them. There are, there, are, there are many competency frameworks that reflect the, the range of competencies required to provide uh, safe and effective care. Uh, the USMLE program is designed to assess as many of those uh, competencies as possible because that, that uh, the range of knowledge, skills, behaviors, um, uh, no one of those uh, have disproportionate weight in the, the provision of safe care. And so really the, the USMLE program and, and medical schools are looking to uh, assess that range of competency. And so, um, you know, I guess the, the, the short answer is we would really like you not to focus on any one of those areas, but to, to help us uh, train and license uh, well-rounded, effective uh, phys physicians that can provide the kind of patient care that we and our families uh, need. Yeah. Yes, sir. Dr. Estab, Kansas Board. A number of years ago, I was involved with the standard setting uh, committee. And as you opened your remarks, you were saying that there were a number of states that uh, had no failure rates and thus the impetus to get to where we are now. During the standard setting event, a question was asked how many people fail, and it was for step three, how many people fail percentage wise? They said only 2% fail. So we've moved from passing everybody to failing 2%. Is that really a, 
uh, an advance over what we had before? That's a fair question because clearly the, the, the first taker pass rate on all of the U of Simile steps tends to be in the mid-90s or upper 90s. And so it, it's a fair question to ask then, well, okay, if, if essentially 95 out of every 100 examinees you know, who are attending a U.S. accredited medical school are, are passing this, what, what value is being added? I, I think one, two things. Number one, one could say, well, are, is the standard that we are applying really adequate, appropriate? And there's a balance there. I've seen that play out at the management committee for USMLE that, uh, that grapples with that decision because you are taking some input directly from a, a third party and those standard setting panels as you participated in, we, it's not an accident that we bring in individuals who are not already part of a USMLE committee to do that because we want somebody from the outside to take a look and say, well, what do you think might be more appropriate? So that's one thing. The, the committee has to grapple with them that as well as other factors around uh, just being cognizant of what is the down or the upstream and downstream impact of if you make a sudden dramatic change in the cut score. I think the other thing though that I would go back to is just that broader philosophical piece about principles which in some ways if our, there is that value in the principle of an independent third party audit, I would still question if we were to lose that what does that mean with that two, three, four, five percent who are being identified at this point that would not be identified in any capacity knowing what we do that, and I don't mean this as a knock against medical, reg, uh, medical educators, but when educators themselves will acknowledge there's individuals that proceed through the system and that all of them know that, well, this is not the person I'd want providing care to my family, it takes you back to the value of that first principle, I think. And so I think that's the way I would respond to that. But as a cardiac surgeon for 40 years, never having delivered a baby for 40 years, and doing the OBGYN questions, et cetera, yeah. and passing the exam, I, I went away with a, an idea that who fails this exam? But uh, I think you've answered the question. Right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Renee Saunders, Tennessee Board of Medical Examiners. And so I have a you're nodding because I'm always asking questions, right? <laughs> we like the questions. So thank you so much. So my question is about um, an issue that's given us a little bit of heartburn, me in particular, because I do a lot of the application reviews and then I typically get the request for this step, I'm gonna call it a step exception for lack of a better term. Right. Uh, so the Tennessee Board of Medical Examiners, unfortunately, it takes us such a long time to promulgate rules and have them become active that um, two or so years ago, they promulgated a rule that changed the maximum number of um, step attempts from four to six. Oh. And then you guys announced <laughs> that you were going to four. I'm going to say while that rulemaking was in the pipeline, probably about a year after they had made their decision. Right. So now we're at the step um, yeah. attempts are um, capped at four. And I think about two days after you all made that decision and it became public, we probably got about three requests for step exceptions. And um, so maybe one of those requests came from someone who uh, attended school in Tennessee, mm -hmm. uh, and two requests came from uh, somebody, one in Virginia and maybe one in Ohio, for instance. And so we have, you know, a list of criteria that we use. It's arbitrary, I think. I'm not really sure that it's set in stone. Um, but so my, I guess my question is, because I'm still confused about this, what is the... Uh, blowback or the responsibility to the granting medical board from the USMLE. How do you all look at us if we decide to grant an exception and we fill out that form and send it in? And then the second part of that question is uh, relative to the notes that you put on the USMLE uh, transcript. Super interesting and thank you for doing that. We had a, a person who requested who uh, had an irregularity, right. um, the board, we, I couldn't do it myself, make the decision myself, so we brought it actually to the board. The um, candidate came to the meeting, was interviewed by the board. The board decided with all the information that we had and we tried to get as much information. Ms. Buono might have been 
involved do you, I don't, I think I remember the guy's name, but I was involved in an email string between myself and the executive director as well before we brought this guy in. The board determined that they were comfortable with granting an exception. We sent the paperwork in and then we got a notice that, are you sure you wanna do this? Is the board sure they wanna do this? Blah, 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 blah. So what, what, are, what am I missing here? Should we be just refusing any exceptions? Or are we looked upon as, oh wow, you're gonna, you know, people are gonna say, apply to Tennessee because Tennessee's gonna give you an exception? No, well, no, we do not essentially frown upon your request in any way, shape, or form. I, I think what you described, if I understood correctly, was, you know, your attempt limit at this time is at six, correct? And so it's, it's more generous than what the program has adopted. So one of the things that we would, I think, say to any state medical board, for instance, if, is that if, as long as this is not going to conflict with sort of your statute in particular, or maybe your specific requirements for licensure, then yeah, we are willing to support uh, or you know, move through that request that you're making to allow that individual to have one additional attempt. And, and I guess, Mike, that's one thing I don't know if we made real clear that in going down to four attempts, Previously, the policy was, you know, someone might be able to, okay, I got one additional attempt by going to Tennessee, but let's say they didn't pass. We didn't cut them off from going to another state and trying to get an additional attempt. Again, it's one t attempt now, that's it. That's the only one they get. So I don't think you've, we welcome you asking questions and saying, hey, are we doing this right? Amy, you, maybe you can clarify too. Well, I just wanted to add that any board that receives a USMLE transcript and has questions about it, especially in instances of irregular behavior, call, call us directly and we're happy to walk you through it and supply you with all of the materials related to why the committee that reviews these cases made the decision that they made and um, we can kind of talk about a little more detail of the significance of of the irregular behavior annotation. So we're happy to help any medical board that receives one of those and yeah. be as helpful as we can. And you know, obviously you and your board are gonna make that decision, but we will supply you with as much information as we can. Yeah. Thank you. Final, maybe final question, I guess. Thank you very much. Tom Lee, New York State Board. Um, I think the task here is to provide value to the end users uh, of the tests, right? And in doing away with a numeric score and going to pass fail in step one, you really take away the options for either the test takers or the uh, institution. I've spoken to many colleagues at AAMC and they share their frustration in that uh, they now lack this part of the tool for evaluation uh, without an appropriate substitute uh, to add to that armamentarium to assure that we have the best qualified applicants. And as prior speakers have also pointed out that in our effort to promote equity and inclusion, we're actually, in, in fact, promoting the opposite. So I just asked the, um, the work group and the board to look at this once again. I think we want to promote the best qualified candidates and bring people up, not push people down. And that's our goal. Thank you. Thank you. You want to respond, or want me to? I, I, I appreciate the comment. Uh, I think the one area I might push back a little bit is that ultimately the end user, though, of the USMLE is the licensing community, and their needs do not, their needs are on that minimally acceptable level of performance. And so, frankly, a pass fail outcome by itself supports the actual requirement of a state medical board. And so, I guess I would as I said, push back a little bit on that front in that, that because that is the primary user of those scores. And so that is really all they require uh, in terms of a USMLE outcome. But well, I know we're drawing toward the end of time. In fact, there's a reference committee about to take place in five minutes. And so uh, perhaps we should call things here. And thank you for uh, joining us. And thank you for all the questions. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you.